comments uh, for people, people can join in as we get started. So hello everyone, thank you. Welcome uh, to this online information session about the Comox Valley Sewer Conveyance Project um, for Lazo area residents. Uh, we're gonna get started on the information that you've joined us to hear in just a moment, but first I just wanna touch on a couple housekeeping items before we dive in. So first of all, uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Colleen Dane. I'm with Sync Strategies, and my role today is to help facilitate uh, the presentation and the Q&A session this evening and hope keep, to keep everything running smoothly. Helping me today on the technical side is my colleague, Emily Kendi. Um, our goal as a team today is to be able to provide you an update on the Comox Valley Sewer Conveyance Project and to provide some additional information um, about questions and comments that uh, people have had in the past about the project, uh, specifically from this area. Our presenter today will be Russell Dyson, the Chief Administrative Officer for the Comox Valley Regional District. And we also have Mark Rutten, the General Manager of Engineering Services here, Chris LaRose, the Senior Manager of Water Wastewater Services, and Zoe Berkey, the Project Engineer for Water and Wastewater Projects to help answer our questions during the Q&A portion of the session. We're also thankful for the group of experts um, technical experts that are on the line with us to help answer questions uh, that you might have along the way. And so we'll call on them as needed. We definitely have the expertise here on the line. So ask any questions. We encourage you to ask any questions that you have. We expect the presentation will take about 20 minutes and then we will switch over to the Q&A portion of our hour. Um, in this webinar format, we will collect your Q questions through the Q&A window. And so you find that by clicking on the little Q&A dialog box button in the bottom black bar of your Zoom screen. And if you click on that, you'll open up a window and a place that you can type in questions. Uh, we'll get to them after the presentation, but you can drop them in along the way. Uh, feel free to make it anonymous by clicking the anonymous, make it anonymous button beside the question box. And once the questions are up, if you see something that is an important question to you, uh, you can always upvote it by clicking the little thumbs up underneath the question. Uh, and that helps us know that it's a popular one and we can make sure that it gets put forward to the panelists. We do hope to get to every question though today. Um, we'll do our best to do that, uh, but any remaining questions will be followed up with afterwards uh, so that we can make sure you have the information uh, that you're looking for. Finally, if you are phoning in today, uh, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. And uh, if we see that hand raised, we will uh, call upon you by your last four digits of your phone number to be able to bring forward your question to the panel. So this session is being recorded. We will be sharing it to the CBRD's website in the next few days so that you can review it or share it with other people who might be interested. Um, and we will let you know when that is available. Finally, if you're having any technical hiccups um, with your audio or seeing things on the screen right now, um, please feel free to reach out to Emily using the chat window. Um, so that's the little icon down at the bottom, uh, just over from the Q&A, and we'll try our best to help troubleshoot from a distance. So with that, I think we're ready to get rolling. Um, thanks again, everybody, for giving us this hour of your time after work. Um, and so I'm going to hand over the mic now to Russell Dyson, CAO. Russell, over to you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Welcome, everyone. First, I would like to acknowledge this meeting is being hosted virtually on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land. The CVRD appreciates the support of Chief and Council, the Comox uh, First Nations community and their staff, who have helped us to better steward the land and resources of the Comox Valley. Good evening, my name is Russell Dyson. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer of the Comox Valley Regional District. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, the Sewage Commission Chair, Doug Hillian, intends to be attending and watching tonight. And the Area Director for Electoral Area B, Arzina Hamir, is following this, as well as all of our our uh, Sewage Commission members, if not live tonight, the tapings of these events. We're grateful for the time you have taken to be with us today and glad to be back speaking with you again. Following our update to you, to you last spring, it has taken us longer than first expected, but we've covered quite a bit of ground since then. And there are a number of updates we would like to share with you, including how we have addressed the feedback we heard from the community last year. When we last spoke, the project was preparing to go to an alternative approval process for funding the project. 
that approval was given in the summer of 2021. And since then, there's been significant planning and assessment work underway. Before, before I dive into the bulk of the presentation, I want to thank you for remaining active, engaging with us in this project, and for sharing your feedback. Our planning and design work have considered this input, and by understanding the issues that are important to you, we can make sure that we are providing you with relevant information as the project progresses. I am very grateful for the CVRD staff and our consulting team and their dedication to considering your input and making sure this project is a success. We have many issues to consider, and every one of us are pushing for the best possible solution that is effective, a long-term solution, fiscally responsible, addressing the concerns of the neighbourhoods the project crosses. In the past four years, the Sewage Commission has directed staff to get it right. This has resulted in advanced odour improvements at our treatment plant, among many other decisions. We look forward to taking your questions at the end of this presentation, and I really encourage you to please use the chat function. We regret that there was not, it was not possible to have an in-person event. We know that many of you would have preferred that, the opportunity to talk face-to-face, -face, and certainly we would have appreciated that too. But unfortunately, where things are at with the pandemic, that was not possible at this time. We look forward to the opportunities in the future. I have about 12 slides to walk you through today. With updates since our last meeting, further information about drilling and various techniques and processes, and details about the groundwater protection policy, which has been developed in response to the concerns raised by this group. I'll now just call up that, that uh, slide presentation. Russell, if I can just hop in for a second, I wanted to also let uh, those on the webinar today know that we did do another webinar yesterday at lunchtime. They might have noticed that when they were registering for this one, that there were two dates available. That, that session covers the same presentation that you're about to give. It's posted to the connectcbrd.ca website right now if they wanted to review the question and answer portion of that section as well. Great, thank you very much, Colleen. And you should be seeing about the conveyance project, our first slide. First, for those of you joining for the first time, or just those that want a refresher, we'll start with a little background about the entire sewage conveyance project. The project was conceived as part of a liquid waste management planning process. This is a formal process following a provincial standard. It includes extensive public consultation to develop a long-term plan for sewage service, not only the conveyance, but the treatment and the potential reuse of materials and products. It will replace the pipes, upgrade the pump stations that move more than 14,000 cubic meters of raw sewage each day to the sewage treatment plant on Brent Road. The sewage from municipal residents, this is the sewage from municipal residents, but it also includes our schools, the hospital, and the commercial outlets we all rely on. Infrastructure replacement is not unusual as similar works are being undertaken because they are aging across North America. In our case, the conveyance project is urgently needed to protect the beaches and waters throughout the Comox estuary, Point Homes, Goose Fit, and of course, Bain Sound. The new system will route sewer pipes further inland where they will no longer be vulnerable to storm damage, waves, wind, rocks, and, and other, other things along the coastline. Construction is expected to begin in spring 2023 with the completion of the project in the fall of 2024, although some pre-digging work could commence this year along IR number one. This process will ensure the preservation of archaeological sensitive areas along Comox Road. This project is built on three years of engagement and planning work. There's quite a bit of detail in this slide, but I wanted to highlight a few of the pieces of it. Remember, this presentation will be available to you online where you may review these slides in more detail at your convenience. We started the liquid waste management planning process with public engagement at various touch points at four different times. It was used to define the values that should be used in decision making, create long list of, of various options, shorten those and make, make more detailed assessments of the options, and finally the alternative approval process. In 2020, we started hosting these information sessions specifically with the Lazo area residents, recognizing that there are concerns and questions unique to this area. We've now held three online sessions, which are all documented on our website and available for you to refer back to. We're nearing the final decisions on the project scope. This is the project laid out with all of the details, including the final, final route. 
The project scope incorporates additional assessment work undertaken once the CVRD received funding approval and is more concrete, a more concrete roadmap for moving forward. Our recent work has led to a few updates to our project route since the last community update. Here we can see on this slide the current route map. There are seven areas of focus that I will quickly review with you, starting in the west. That's on your, the left-hand side of the screen at the Courtney pump station. The key changes since we last spoke include the Courtney pump station itself. It will be replaced further away from the river. This is to provide protection against rising sea levels and to meet modern seismic standards. In fact, the entire project will withstand earthquakes far better than our existing infrastructure. In this slide, as we move along Comox Road, we have moved the route further inland in order to avoid areas of archaeological significance for the Comox First Nations. We continue to work with them in partnership on this planning work to be sure we get it right. Also, moving the alignment off of Comox Road may alleviate some of the traffic concerns that we would face with this project. At IR number one, we will complete a pre-dig of the route to better manage any archaeological findings. Further, the pump station that's located there will be upgraded and flow directed back to the Courtney pump station. In the town of Comox, along Comox Hill, the conveyance pipe will now be laid out using traditional trenching or cut and cover. It was previously proposed to be drilled. However, technical assessment and cost benefit analysis has indicated that this trenching is the best choice here. Remembering that Comox Hill is a much lower elevation making this possible than Lazo Hill. So cut and cover is an option for Comox Hill. Throughout the town of Comox, you can imagine the installation of the works is very challenging and complex. We will weave the pipe through existing utilities while attempting to minimize disturbance on the surface and minimizing disruption to residents, businesses, and commuters. We are very grateful for town staff and the town council that are working with us to finalize these details. A portion of the route Rodello Street and Stewart Street has been moved from Comox Avenue to Beaufort Avenue, again alleviating traffic concerns while the work is constructed and just being a better route for the eventual pipe. Furthermore, there will be an upgrade to the Jane Place pump station. Then to the layout for Lazo. As you can see in this diagram, we have narrowed the route for Lazo, and I will provide a better slide that will show that in more detail. I'll also go through some of the decision points and reasons for that with you on later slides. Before we leave this slide, I'd just like to touch on the, the eastern end of the project, and that is near the treatment plant. To the east, we are seeking an alternative to drilling through Lazo Marsh. In order to protect this area, we are looking for additional options that will allow crossing without risking the groundwater to the area. My focus now will be the Lazo neighborhood portion of the project. We've appreciated the time the community has taken over the past few years to join these sessions and share the questions and concerns. We've heard consistently some key themes, groundwater protection, concern about the quality and quantity of groundwater being negatively impacted by installation of the sewer pipe, aquifer protection, the potential risk to the aquifer, to the individual wells and the natural environment in the extremely unlikely event of a leak, risk protection. There have been many questions about the CVRD what we can do to protect against the risk in the first place, specifically around what technology will be used, including the early detection system and materials to prevent a pipe leak. Property impacts. You have been concerned about how this project could impact your individual property, and that is totally understandable. It's been foremost in our mind. We've heard concerns about the impact of the right-of-way should one be needed, particularly in the event of a repair, as well as neighborhood impacts during constructions and long-term impacts to property values. I want to make it clear that, there, that these points have been considered seriously in all of our planning work since we last spoke to you. I believe that the route we present to you is, is the best to address the concerns that have been raised. So on that note, what have we been doing since our last update? The answer is a lot of technical planning that is reliant on engineering, hydrological, and geotechnical experts, and we're very grateful for the consultants assisting us in this project. We have retained experts in all relevant aspects of the engineering horizontal directional drilling and groundwater who have been working to develop and assess the options. 
We have completed a detailed review of the system hydraulics to design a lower risk, non-pressurized gravity flow pipe through, through Lasso Hill area. We've included the use of resilient high density propy polyethylene or HDPE material for the pipe. We have continued to review coordination with groundwater expert GW solutions to verify that there is no impact to the aquifer. And we have refined our route map to avoid wells, to limit the number of right of way on property and reduce pipe layout impacts. And we have completed further geotechnical testing to determine a safe pipe route. On the picture here, you might have seen this geotechnical rig undertaking drilling in some of the community. That was part of the process to give us the information necessary for these decisions. All of these steps speak to addressing the concerns that have been raised around groundwater and aquifer protection, protecting against environmental risks, and reducing impacts. This series of graphics shows a step-by-step -step process to describe how the drilling will take place and occur as a tunnel pipe is constructed through Lazo Hill. In the first illustration, we see the project sets up in the entrance point where the drilling commences. Starting at the entry level where equipment is set up, the drill creates the first path for the new sewer pipe. This is a narrow tunnel that establishes the route from the start to the exit point. At the exit point, we undertake a reaming pass. A reamer is pulled back through the initial hole to widen the tunnel. At the same time, a bentonite slurry is installed, which keeps the hole stable and also helps as a lubricant. The assembled pipe is then pulled back through the tunnel that has been created as a result of this process, that pipe having been laid down on the ground in advance. Zooming in now to the Lazo Hill alignment, which we know is the most interest to you on this call. You'll see on this map, the proposed route laid out in blue and how it avoids wells in the area, the the X's, the red X's that you see on the map. This alignment has been selected for a number of reasons, including the path offers a minimum of 20 meter offset from all deep water ground wells, a distance recommended by GW Solutions. It offers a minimum curve or deflection and a shorter route with less distance to have to drill through, reducing potential challenges in the drilling process. You can see that it has a gradual curve, which is possible given the materials of both the soils and the pipe itself, but you will want to avoid curving the pipe in too many different locations or otherwise that would create friction and may not make it possible. The route impacts the fewest possible private properties. It reduces neighborhood disruptions caused by pipe laydown, and it aligns with the plan to eliminate tunneling beneath Lasso Marsh. Engineering decisions about the method and materials for the new system provide additional protection for the environment. And I'd just like to talk about two key decisions that are included with respect to pipe flow and pipe materials. In this illustration, the brown line represents the land or the, the surface of the land, obviously exaggerated to show the Lazo Hill and the area surrounding. The pipe, which is trenched through the town of Comox in this area, and then it goes through the gravity, or pardon me, the tunnel created through this process, and then exits. The aquifer is, is demonstrated here. The line through Lazo Hill will be gravity fed. A gravity fed line means the pipe is not under the pressure through this section. This technology virtually eliminates what was already a very low risk of a leak because there's no pressure on the inside of the pipe. The gravity slope allows the route to remain 10 meters above the aquifer rather than diving down into the aquifer itself, further protecting the water source. Because the pipe has to be strong enough to withstand the stress of its installation, the pipe's strength far exceeds what is required for a zero pressure system. So a thicker, more rigid pipe with no pressure on the system is what we propose to do. Also, the pipe material, I mentioned the high density polyethylene, HDPE. The shorter route I talked about a few slides ago allows us to use this material, which is preferable because it is more resistant to corrosion than steel pipe. It is more flexible and better suited to withstand seismic activity. The pipe sections are fused to eliminate all joints, which can be higher at risk for leakage. 
It is more resistant to internal abrasion and has no external coating that could be damaged in the process. All of these factors to continue to speak to the concerns we heard from the community about protection of the groundwater, the aquifer, and the risk. There are two main ways that this work will impact Lazo area properties. The orange diagram here shows the layout that I've previously described of the tunneling, and the blue shows the location upon which the pipe will be laid out in advance of being pulled through the tunnel. Right-of-way access. There will be 15 properties. There are 15 properties in total located both in the town of Comox and Electoral Area B, which will need right-of-way access for the, laid, for the pipe and the tunneling. Our land agents have reached out to these 15 property owners. There are also an additional three properties not requiring a right-of-way, but we will want to undertake some survey work, and our land agents have contacted them too. If you have not heard from our land agents, this means that your property is not impacted and no discussion is required with the land agents impacted by the right-of-way. The CVRD has secured land agents Jim Riches and Len Haley to undertake these discussions with those property owners. If you are one of the 15 right-of-way property owners, we encourage you to continue to engage with our land agents on matters of concern about the project until negotiations are complete. Having said that, CVRD staff and our consultants are supporting the land agents with background and technical information to respond to the questions that the landowners may ask of our land agents, so we're there to support them. The laydown area. The pipe needs to be assembled and laid out above ground before being pulled underground, and that's the area in blue. With this proposed route determined, the pipe will be laid down through the Lazo Marsh, through the CVRD sewage treatment plant, and along Brent Road. This route offers the least amount of impact on traffic possible and reduces the number of property owners who will be disrupted by the laydown, which of course is only for the short term in advance of it being pulled through the created tunnel. Here are some photos just to illustrate the description of the work and the impacts that we've just reviewed. The image on the far right shows the level of activity and the type of equipment that would typically be present at the entry pit location during the pipe installation, including the drilling rig, including the drilling rig, the driver's cab, and an area for, for two, tool storage. The photo on the top left shows the typical level of disruption on the street where the pipe would be laid down. You can see here the process of fusing the pipe together. You can see here uh, the, near the worker's hands, just the thickness of the type of pipes that are used and how that varies from common construction and some of the equipment that's used to support it. Then finally, how the pipe will be lifted by small cranes before it is pulled into the pipe. Please note that this, in this picture, the, sorry, I already talked about the thickness of the pipe, but that shows some of the equipment that will be used to guide the pipe as it's placed into the tunnel. Our engineers can offer more details about these processes should you ask in the question and answer period. I'm now nearing the end of my presentation and have just two more important slides to present to you. Along with addressing the concerns raised by you in the design work completed to date, we also saw the opportunity to offer additional confidence to the community by developing a groundwater protection policy. This document will secure the commitments made here and ensure that they are being upheld in the future, regardless of changes in staff or political members. The draft policy will be made available on our website, I think it is now, after, and after this meeting, and is it expected to go before the Sewage Commission to be ratified on February the 15th. The groundwater protection policy has a number of commitments, including establishing of a monitoring program, Commitment to design and building a well-engineered pipe that will not leak and can withstand seismic events. Commitment to test for leaks using acoustic detection. And in the minute chance of a leak, and I must emphasize that we are committed to building a highly engineered pipe that will not leak, the repair will be completed as quickly as possible. Again, in the exceedingly rare chance of a leak that contaminates a well, all reasonable assistance will be offered to provide the property owner with clean, safe water with limited disruption. And finally, the timeline ahead. Along with a more complete plan comes a more complete timeline for the steps forward in 2022. It will be a busy year for preparation, including a general public update on the liquid waste management plan and the conveyant project scope, as well as engagement on construction planning. 
Construction is estimated to start in the spring of 2023 and be complete in the fall of 2024, with the exception being some pre-digging that may occur this year on IR number one. We look forward to keeping you informed moving forward, and I encourage you to continue your engagement with this project to take the opportunity tonight to ask your questions. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'll pass it back to Colleen and she'll facilitate the question period. Thank you very much for your consideration. And I just wanna mention Colleen, if at any point you want me to share this, uh, these slides to help answer questions or any of our consultants ask me to do that, I will. Otherwise I will uh, stop sharing now. Okay, thank you Russell. Thanks for that overview and all that information. Um, I'm going to dive, we can dive into the question and answer uh, portion of our hour now. I see our Q&A window has room for questions, so if anybody has one that they would like to add in there, please feel free. Just a reminder, you can open up the Q&A window by just clicking on the Q&A icon in the bottom black bar of your Zoom screen, and then just type in your question there. You can choose to make it anonymous by clicking the box beside the question uh, before posting it, and we can also uh, upvote questions if you see one come in that's important to you and then that helps us identify um, popular questions. So while I give uh, people a moment or two to be able to add questions in there, I'm going to start with a couple of questions that were emailed in in advance. Um, and so starting uh, probably with you, Chris, uh, for this question. Um, the, the question is about why, um, whether or not HDD could have been used along the Lazo Road right of way rather than having to go kind of through private property in order to reduce uh, the impacts on on properties and um, and potentially on wells and groundwater there. Sure. Thanks, Colleen. Um, and good, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so in answer to this question, we, we, um, we were navigating a, a number of, of key constraints in developing or optimizing the route for the horizontal directional drill section through Lazo Hill. Um, and just one of them was, was, was being able to uh, follow the, the correct hydraulic grade line or the, you know, basically getting the, um, <clears throat> minimizing the height of the tunnel uh, was kind of top of the list um, given the risks inherent to um, elevated pressures at our pump stations. So operational risks as well as long-term cost of operating, just pushing that wastewater up and up and over a much higher uh, height of land. So the constraint, uh, you know, governing um, that particular alternate route was the elevation of the other end of Lazo. So um, um, for those of you that are familiar with the, with the area, you'll, be, you'll, you'll know that um, if you're on Lazo and looking, or it might, might even be uh, Curtis at that point, and looking down Moreland, Moreland slopes uh, fairly steeply down to the north. Um, so following the, uh, an HDD alignment following Lazo, the, the uh, east to west section of Lazo, um, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to surface at the other end, at the east end. Um, so we had to shift that to that end of the alignment north to follow the contours of the of the hill down to to get to the point where we where we had a uh, an ending you know if we considered the east end of the tunnel as the end the west as the start to have an ending elevation that matched or that that uh, that allowed us to achieve our other our other objectives. So it's all about elevation. Um, that being said, you know, with the the existing alignment does kind of optimize. We tried to maximize the length of that uh, alignment that 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 followed underneath road right of ways, and an example of that is you, you zoom in and look at the kind of Painter Place and Forrester. You know that was one of our our, our drivers there was to was to align that that um, that pipe under that cul-de-sac and follow it over to to Forrester to to minimize the number of homes that that um, that are impacted, the number of SRWs that need to be negotiated with property owners. Yeah, so hopefully I've answered that question. And one more that came in by email before I get to a couple that have come in on the Q&A window. So we know, obviously, Russell mentioned the 15 properties uh, that require right-of-ways. Does the pipe go under the houses on any of those properties? And if so, how, it, how um, would potential damages to that building be covered during um, from either construction work or repair work if that were ever needed? Yeah, sure. So there are, so first of all, there are um, a couple 
homes that, um, under which the pipe is is uh, projected to, to pass under. Um, so that's uh, for a, a total um, HDD section length of around 1.3 kilometers. There's I think there's two two homes and uh, and a, and a outbuilding that are directly over top of the pipe. Um, so you know, given the, um, the extremely strong commitment from the CVRD to designing and building a, a system. You know that has as little chance of, of 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 having a leak as possible, and the fact that um, you know, of that thirteen hundred meter length, you know only you know, approximately twenty to thirty meters of that would actually pass under structure. You know the likelihood of of of, of such a circumstance happening is extremely low. That being said, um, you know we have to we have to provide for any any possible eventuality. So the um, the, the SRWs that are under under negotiation do provide. Um, the CVRD, the ability to you know, to respond and repair to a, a leak in that extremely unlikely event that a leak were to occur directly underneath of the structure, um, the the repair methodology does involve coming directly down from above. So there there is an, an infinitesimally small you know possibility that um, that modifications would have to be done um, to to those structures. But the CVRD takes you know, full responsibility for. Uh, and this is in, enshrined. But this will be enshrined in that statutory right of way agreement. The full responsibility for full restoration of property and improvements um, in the event of that type of repair. Great, thank you. Um, our first question that came in uh, references some conversation that was had during the webinar yesterday. Um, and so, before I kind of get to the question, I thought maybe Chris, could you? provide a bit of an overview about the leak detection um, system that will be used for um, for this pipe, just to provide a bit of background. Sure, yeah, great idea, Colleen. Um, so so um, embedded within the groundwater protection policy that Russell referred to in his presentation is a commitment to, um, so first commitment was to, um, is to design and to do everything possible to design and build a system that uh, that will not leak. The second commitment is to, you know, monitor for a leak. Um, and there's two parts to that commitment. The first part is ongoing monitoring um, of the groundwater wells that um, on which we have installed monitoring gear. So there's nine wells that are geographically or spatially distributed along the um, the alignment that uh, that have that equipment that will be monitoring the groundwater level um, and the groundwater quality in real time. Um, st you know, starting over the past few weeks, a couple months, um, right through to the end of the construction and beyond. So they will provide a, um, a clear record, a baseline of what that groundwater quality is before and after construction. So that will provide a kind of a, a fallback monitoring for the presence of, of, of wastewater proxies within the, the groundwater. Um, but from a leak detection perspective, so that's kind of, like I said, a, a kind of a fallback. It's a the safety net. Uh, the primary um, leak detection mechanism will be a acoustic leak detection inspection that will be done um, annually on this pipe. Um, and so what that will involve is, uh, because we've, as, as Russell explained um, in the presentation, if you think back to that graph showing the cross section of the hill and the way that water flows up and then cascades down that pipe at gravity pressure. So gravity flow within that uh, hill so one of the implications of that shift from a pressurized pipe to a, uh, a gravity flow pipe, which is an atmospheric pressure, so no pressure in the pipe, is that um, it, it makes acoustic leak detection difficult because that technology you know, listens for the, um, the hissing noise that, that a, a leak makes from a pressurized pipe. So um, what, we would, what we will do on, the, on that annual basis during that inspection is um, it's actually adjust a valve that will be located somewhere downstream, likely at the treatment plant, that will allow that, that pipe to fill with water for the you know, five or six hour duration of this test, uh, fill with water um, up to the, to the height, the, the high point on that system, which will be at the near Torrance and Lazo end of the pipe. And then we'll insert the acoustic leak listening de device, which is a, which we've used successfully locally, both on the wastewater side and, and for our water systems. Um, this is used extensively you know, around the world for leak detection in, in these types of systems. So that instrument will, will be inserted at the one end, the upstream end of the pipe, and will be run, um, will flow with the flow of wastewater uh, down to be captured at the other end. And along the way, um, it will be um, 
recording its location and listening carefully for the acoustic signature. So that hissing noise that uh, that a leak would make as this water is pushed out of a pinhole leak or, or a crack. Uh, so again, that would be done on an annual basis. And that frequency that we've, um, that, that, that frequency of, a, of, a, of an annual test has been selected you know, after working extensively with GW Solutions to, um, you know, as part of their study work into determining the minimum safe distance for between the, the, the pipe and drinking water wells. Uh, you know, they, they looked very carefully um, and modeled the travel time from a hypothetical leak from that pipe, how long it would take from that pipe uh, to travel to a, a nearby well. Um, and, 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 and according to their analysis, you know, we're looking at you know, approximately five or 600 days of travel time. Um, and so our, our selection of an, of an annual acoustic leak inspection would, uh, is designed to provide us time in the worst case scenario, a leak were to occur immediately after the last inspection, we would, we would then um, we would then have time to undertake the next inspection, pick up the leak and undertake a repair before that wastewater could feasible, feasibly travel to the nearest well. And that's assuming that leak were to happen at a location where wells are, are that close. But in reality, the vast majority of that length uh, the wells are significantly farther away than 20 meters. Um, I think part of that question following up was, sorry, is there an echo that you guys are hearing? Okay. Um, so I think part of that question after was about the, the terminology around detection. Um, and this questionnaire is suggested that locator might be the word that uh, feels more on track for them. Um, so just to follow up, because there's been another question following on that response you just gave, Chris, can you explain how a leak detection system works in an unpressurized pipe section? So theoretically without offering that um, maybe not picturing that hissing sound, or if that is still kind of the way that it would be picking it up. Yeah, no. So that's 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 exactly the the, the point um, that I was trying to make, and that and that is that a you know when we were originally envisioning this this um, horizontal directional drilled section, it was it was it was um, it was envisioned to be pressurized, and that's you know when we when we made that commitment to undertake leak detection. When we shifted to the to, to gravity flow through this area, which, as Russell mentioned, will, will vastly decrease the likelihood of a leak, and not just the likelihood, but in that extreme, much less likely event that there is a leak, the impact as well, because there won't be pressure behind that flow pushing out of a hypothetical crack or pinhole. Um, so that, that you know, a significant improvement, but at the same time, that that made it effectively impossible to undertake acoustic leak detection. So working with the, the very smart people at, uh, at, at HDR, so Walt Bayless and his team um, developed a, a solution to that, which is installation of a, a valve at the Columbus Valley Water Pollution Control Center. So downstream, which would, during the inspection, would be there solely for, the, for this purpose, would be you know, partially shut to allow the wastewater in that line to back up and fully um, fill that, uh, that normally gravity flowed section. So all the way back to the high point, which would be at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the west end of the tunnel. And so in, in so doing, that would generate the pressure in the pipe that is required to undertake an acoustic leak detection. So that's uh, so the answer is that we you, you can't undertake acoustic leak detection without the pressure in the pipe. But uh, Walt and his team have come up with a way for us to do that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. The next question is uh, about road closures. Are there uh, roads expected to be closed during construction in the Lazo Hill area? And if so, do we have a sense of how long those closures will be? Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the major advantages of the HDD um, installation is that uh, it, it does minimize the disruption to, to, to traffic, just given that the, the bulk of that, that work is happening underground and well away from roads. That being said, um, the intersection of Torrance and Lazo you know, will be a hub of activity during certain parts of construction. Um, the bulk of the, of the, the drilling work will, will be occurring on private property, um, but there will be some, some cut and cover uh, happening um, for the final section of um, just, you know, just, just where the purple um, meets the orange there 
uh, near Balmoral and, and Lazo. So that intersection, you know, there will be times where it'll be quite busy there. Um, there. There may be lane closures that will be communicated well in advance so that the public has plenty of notification you know, to, to, to take an alternate route. Um, but we don't envision any full, like both lane closures on either Lazo or Torrance. Um, but again, if, uh, if, if and when there are projected impacts, we'll communicate very early with the public so that there's plenty of time to, to plan alternate routes into and out of town. Thank you. Um, and then the next question um, might be a bit rhetorical, but it asks whether or not the Poly B plumbing pipes that were installed all the years before would have had the same promise about never leaking. So perhaps maybe a bit of information about confidence in the HDP um, material would be helpful here to kind of address um, kind of why the CBRD feels confident about uh, about using it. Sure, you know, I, I think um, we've got uh, some of our key advisors on, on, on the line today. I'm thinking maybe the Walt, Walt Bayless from HDR would be better um, equipped to, to answer this one than myself. Thanks, Walt. It's over to you. Thanks, Chris. I. I think the main difference is that high density polyethylene has been around for just as long and it was first approved for AWWA water use in 1978 and it's been in continuous operation for water systems uh, since that time and in fact gaining more use as the years have uh, identified the need for seismically resilient and abrasion corrosion resistant materials. So unlike other materials that you know, 30, this was in place over 50 years ago and is continuing to be used. Great, thank you. Um, the next question asks about whether or not the town of Comox has a tree bylaw that would protect um, existing trees uh, during the construction of this project. Now, I know that's the town, um, and but maybe you can speak to whether or not um, kind of existing trees are being considered in the construction planning process uh, or through your conversations with the town. I see Russell wait, raising his hand. So I'll throw this one to you, Russell. Yeah, actually, I was itching myself, but I, I know a oh. little bit, and Chris can <laughs> fill in. And um, we, we, we are working very, um, very well with the town in terms of ensuring that there is the most minimal disruption and so the detailed design is 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 being shared with them and we're we're looking at ways and means of alleviating the impact not only to their utilities and infrastructure and roadways and streets but uh, uh, trees as well and i really appreciate that during the open house period uh, many residents came forward especially along balmoral to express their concerns about uh, about just that 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 we be mindful of uh, of, of the trees that exist that are either natural or street trees that have been planted as well. Chris, do you have any more details? Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Russell. Only to add that, um, that we'll be working with an arborist, um, very closely with an arborist to uh, assess the potential for any impacts to trees along the alignment to the town of Comox in response to um, those numerous uh, concerns raised um, at the open houses. Um, and working so closely with, with that arborist to anticipate and mitigate impacts to those trees, um, as well as working with the town of Comox uh, uh, park staff to, to, to draw on their knowledge as well. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is whether or not there will be an increase in pressure as the flow goes down Moreland and it crosses the marsh. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll ask Walt to, um, to speak to this one as well. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, Chris. Uh, the answer is it will continue to flow north on Moreland under gravity conditions until it approximates the same elevation as the wastewater plant across the marsh, at which point it will increase uh, in pressure. So generally speaking, at very low flows, it will be very even nearly atmospheric pressure at, at zero PSI at the north end of Moreland Road. Uh, and, and as the flows increase, it would increase to five to 10 PSI under uh, maximum demand and flow conditions. So still quite significantly lower than most people would be used to for operating pressures. Great, and then a couple more, a comment about the leak detection system and, a, and another question. Um, 
it, it is about a third party review of the plan. It says, it, it says that um, there's been a commitment made to a third party review, um, whether or not that's happened, who is that reviewer and what their opinion is on the leak detection system that's proposed. Sure, yes. So we did undertake a, um, a value engineering exercise at the end of 2020. Um, so that um, that's a, a very rigorous and, and um, a structured a one week process, you know, where um, experts from around the continent in the kind of relevant disciplines that that uh, that are involved in a project like this are are brought together, are kind of brought up to speed on on the concept of the project, and then spend a week you know, picking it apart um, in, in in a great level of detail, and then generate a report at the end, which um, you know makes recommendations. So there were uh, several key recommendations that came out of that process. Um, you know, for example, we were planning to get to uh, to um, continue to use the force main from the existing court and pump station to the town of Comox. Um, as a result of their review, um, they, they called it. They, you know, they raised some concerns about the continued use of that pipe, given its age, uh, material type. Um, so there was that, that change was made. Um, at that time, there was uh, some some conversations about uh, leak detection. Um, and uh, no concerns were raised with uh, with the approach that uh, that was planned here. Okay, uh, we have kind of thirteen more minutes by my clock, and um, I'm just seeing we're almost to the end of the Q and A list. I see just one more popped in. I'm going to switch over to kind of my last one that I had come in by email, but and give people a moment to add any other questions they have that they'd like us to cover in our next ten minutes or so. So the next one that came in by email is about insurance coverage and just whether or not the CBRD has um, the liability insurance um, to a degree that would be able to protect the properties against potential damage um, from the project uh, in the future. Sure, yeah. So, so um, as, a, as a local government, uh, the CBRD um, belongs to the, and, and um, it, Provided service by the Municipal Insurance Association, the MIA. Um, so we have a blanket liability coverage with a maximum single occurrence claim of forty million dollars. Um, and so uh, our our assessment of the of the risks uh, inherent to operation of this um, this particular system, you know, or that you know, even in a worst case scenario of a of a of a, of a major failure, a leak. Um, which required a, a, a repair from the surface, you know, a leak occurring under a, uh, under a home that needs to be, you know, shifted and and, and rebuilt, you know, all at the CVRD's cost. Um, you know, contamination of, of of points of the aquifer downstream from that point, you know, requiring extension of community water, um, you know, still provides us a significant comfort under that maximum um, that maximum single occurrence claim. Um, so we, we consider ourselves very well covered, you know, and that's in addition to all of the, you know, the extremely high level of due diligence um, that we're taking and ensuring that we're designing and building and monitoring, you know, a, a, as, as robust a system as possible. Okay, we've had one more question, one more comment come into the Q&A. Um, and so the next one is about whether or not there is any expected um, seismic response uh, from the drilling that could impact people's homes. So there's a comment that during some test drilling conducted uh, the other week, uh, they were able to feel a uh, vibration from the, where the drilling was. Is that something that people should expect or how is that monitored moving forward? No, it's a great question. I think I'll, I'll ask Walt to respond, and Walt may um, may, uh, may may draw on Stephanie Robillard's expertise as well. But over to you, Walt. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'll probably I will review this with Stephanie as well and ask for her input. But the it proximity is an important factor. We are quite deep underground, and where there's properties, and we're in the order of thirty plus meters underground, so that's a significant variation. There's always concern whenever you're doing any sort of uh, vibratory work in construction, including rock removal, excavation, and, and in this case, um, directional drilling. As a management of that, the same tools that are applied for all vibratory type construction, including uh, rock work and, and excavation, includes pre-surveys 
and and post surveys and installation of surface vibrate monitoring in order during that process to track this. So uh, very similar to to traditional construction methods, the same uh, practices apply. Stephanie, did did you want to add a bit more to that? Looking at it from the geotech. Um, I think you covered it pretty well. Uh, thanks, Walt. Um, you know, as you said, we're significantly further underground here, um, as opposed to where you're drilling at surface directly adjacent to the homes. Uh, so that's a big difference. Uh, and as you say, you know, monitoring is a big part of construction and uh, the vibration and noise, as well as any movements at surface would be monitored during construction to confirm that everything is held strictly within limits of the contract. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, another question um, is whether or not the upgrade is expected to impact uh, property taxes for lots in the area who are not connected to the sewer system. Yeah, no, no, no changes uh, expected or um, to the property taxes in the area. I'm not sure. Um, we certainly had questions regarding you know, potential impacts to property value. Like, you know, maybe that's where that question is is, is going. Um, and um, so, for those properties that uh, for which we we are we'll, we will be negotiating a statutory right of way, um, you know, there there certainly um, property owners you know, who are working directly with the property agents that uh, that Russell mentioned in his presentation, Jim Riches and and Len Haley. Um, we'll, that, that'll be a topic of conversation. So typically in negotiation of SRWs, um, there's compensation involved for, for any potential loss of rights as, as a result of having uh, any restrictions that are in place as a result of having a pipe under, under, under the, the property. Um, because of the depth of the pipe, as, as was highlighted recently by Walt, um, the level of restrictions on these properties will be very minimal um, in terms of, um, you know, for a typical installation at surface with cut and cover, there'd be restrictions on, on, on building you know, fences, planting large trees, certainly constructing homes or sheds or garages. For a pipe of this depth installed by a tunneling, um, there's no such restrictions. Um, the, one that, the one that jumps to mind is you know, a prohibition on drilling of, of, of wells for obvious reason. We wouldn't want a, a drill rig poking a hole in the pipe. Um, but yeah, so there is compensation involved in the, in the SRW. Um, but the, the you know the corresponding impact on property value is expected to be negligible. That being said, for those properties that are negotiating with Jim and, and Lynn, um, you know that's something that certainly that they can place on the table and and um, and you know have that conversation. And uh, Colleen, I'll just add to the uh, the full costs of the sewer system. The capital costs, operating costs, are passed on to the town of Comox and the city of Courtney and uh, the Department of National Defense, only to those that are connected to the system. We allocate those costs to the town and the city based on flow, and then they transfer those costs to those that are connected to the system. So residents within the town of Comox um, that are connected to the sewer system through, through the town will, will receive an increase in, in, in the, uh, the costs of sewer, as, uh, and that was the issue with respect to the alternate approval process. It was, we are going to need to borrow money that will cost the, those that are part of the system more. And uh, the, the approval for that, that authorized borrowing was provided through that. We're also very fortunate that um, we have built up reserves. So a good portion of this project will be paid by reserves as well, money that is already in hand and that has been saved by the Sewage Commission for specifically for these capital works. Great, thank you. And our final couple of uh, comments are from a property owner asking about the assessment work agreement. Um, have some concerns about the um, the amount of access that's being requested, and you know would like to see some more parameters around um, the amount of time or uh, times that properties would need to be accessed um, for site visits, for assessments, for um, a number of other pieces. So I'm wondering if. Uh, I know that we've talked about uh, the land agents and that the importance of that conversation, but uh, could we give some comment perhaps about uh, about those agreements and um, kind of next steps for people who might want to see um, changes to that, how it's laid out now? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So those are absolutely fair uh, comments or concerns, but as, as you highlighted, Colleen, um, 
and as, as Russell highlighted in his presentation as well, um, really encourage people to work directly with Len and Jim on, on um, you know, if there are suggested changes to that consent agreement or the ensuing SRW, that you know, the, the proper um, avenue there is definitely to work directly with Jim and, and Len. And, um, and I know, the, the, like I said, those are, those are perfectly reasonable uh, concerns. And I think I'm confident that, that working directly with Jim and, and Len, that those can be accommodated. So the purpose of those consent agreements is to um, is to establish you know approval for you know, limited access by our advisors and, and contractors to undertake some of the work that uh, that Walt had intimated you know some pre-construction surveys um, and uh, and other types of survey but but very very limited in nature so I'm I'm, I'm confident that uh, you know working with Jim and Land that um, we can come to some uh, mutually agreeable conditions for, for that access. Okay, and we're down to our last question in the Q&A, which probably lines us up right with um, our expected wrap-up time. So it's a question about budget and whether or not the budget for the project is still estimated to be the 73 million. Thanks, so I, I can answer that. And thank you very much for the question. And it's th something that is really on our mind and our attention of our focus is the cost of this project. As you can imagine, the complexity of such a project and the many factors that are affecting costs that are driving costs up, we are very mindful in this in the current climate. Chris and his team have done a thorough assessment of the potential costs and risks associated with this project. We will be updating our sewage commission on February the 15th with a report that will update the costs. But at this time, I, one thing I can assure you is that we are not going to need to borrow any more money for that the, the project, that is clear, but the full details of where we estimate the project and the project costs will be shared with our sewage commission and our public on the agenda and part of that meeting on February the 15th. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our Q&A window. It brings us to the end of the questions that were emailed in advance. And so hopefully that means that everybody has gotten the information that they were looking for this evening. Before I let everyone go, I'm just going to share one last slide, which has the website address uh, where you can find more information that we talked about, like the groundwater protection policy, the video from yesterday's webinar, the video for this webinar will go up there as well, um, as well as some good uh, frequently asked questions where we can summarize any of the themes of questions that we have been able to address here. There's also an email address and a phone number that I'm hoping you can make note of uh, if you would like to follow up with anything after this session. So with that, I want to just say um, a thank you again to everybody for joining us uh, this evening, giving us some dinner time hour uh, to be able to learn more about the project. We look forward to continuing to keep you informed as we move forward. Um, and in the meantime, we wish you well and uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>